Lee, last time we saw you on television, at least heard your voice on television, you were doing an NBC interview. You said to that producer it would have been your last. Can you talk to us about why you agreed to do this one interview? I heard that you had said this interview with NBC, the last one that you did in 2012, would have been your last interview. Why did you agree to do this interview? Well, I agreed to do this interview because it allowed me to speak to my people, an actual Jamaican audience, which is something that hasn't necessarily been the case. Yes. And um, I believe there's a lot of questions I can answer and address, and also bring to light certain issues that actually are prevalent among the Jamaican community because a lot of parents migrate and leave their children. A lot of the stuff I went through. So this is this is an important discussion. Talk to us about that. What lessons do you want to impart about what happened to you? Because from what I understand, your mom and you left to go to Antigua, and after being in Antigua, you met John Muhammad, and then your mom left and went to the United States, you followed afterwards. Talk to me about what it is that you want to impart on the Jamaican people since you brought it up. The most important thing that you can give to your children is your time. Not things, not possessions, your time. And that's the one thing I did not receive. Before I left Jamaica, my mother asked my father to. He had a house, he had everything, but he decided not. And before that, I ran over to him twice. And he made the decision not to give me this time. Now, for, for a period of time, up until I was like nine years old, he did offer money, support, clothing, but that's not what I needed. I needed this time. And it would have it taken a certain sacrifice to make that happen, but he, he allowed me to stay in his home in Jamaica. He knew I was in the Cayman Islands working at least. He would know where I was at and that I'd be safe. I told my mother, when I went to Antigua, she, I've been being there for three months in an island where I know no one. She left me there for an entire year to fend for myself. That is, that is something very typical when it comes to parents that really doesn't happen. I don't result. And are you saying that John Muhammad became that father figure in your life? Exactly. So what happened is my mom left me in December and in September, I met Muhammad in May because I used to frequent a computer shop where I used to burn CDs because my landlord had cut off my electricity. So that's how I made money by burning CDs and selling music. And um, I saw the relationship he had with his son. And I used to go there every Wednesday to watch him. And he really didn't get in contact until my mom met him in October of that year. And um, Muhammad had a business of bringing people into the U.S. And that's how we met. But that relationship, in my mind, that hunger, that hole was already there. And I needed, I needed just someone to care enough to be there. Because it's not as if I was a, a, a child who was continuing to stay in trouble. I stayed in school, I was at the top of my class, I got good grades, I did everything that I could possibly do. But I did not get that time. And John Mohammed gave you that time. You also seem to have said that he also maybe gave you too much time because you were abused by him. Talk to me about that. Well, that, well, that's what happens when you have a child or an adult with no supervision. That is, that is already vulnerable. It, it, people ask, like, how it happened and why you couldn't leave or do this. It, it, situation in which the same thing happens to abused women. Many of whom are educated, very capable in all of the facets of their life, but in that relationship, they're emotionally, I mean, extremely vulnerable. And so once someone has your mind, they pretty much have everything. Now, we didn't start out as that. We just more into that. And it was a means of control. That's what it was about, that's what it was for, and that's what it was. How did he abuse and, you? Well, it started off with petty, and then it became sexual. That was the abuse. It became sexual, you said? Yes. Yes. So that, that's how 
how the control, that's how why the control was really so powerful because the relationship was not only a father and son. It gets worse. He was telling me what he's doing to me by using analogies of a hunter talking to prey. And he would tell me what he was doing to me without me knowing that he was actually talking about me. And I realize it now, but I, I didn't know it then. It's very sick to think about, but that's exactly what happened. And, um, I mean, there was no one there. There was, I mean, I'd been living on my own for an extensive period of time. And, I mean, it just, it just happened. You also said that he brainwashed you, correct? Correct. But when you were first incarcerated, you seem to have said that even though, this is just from an interview I had read, okay? You seem to have said that even though you grew up without a father, you were still able to have a lot of control. So now it seems, 11 years in, that you've changed your tune to now blaming the fact that you didn't have this father figure in your life. Back then, you seemed less remorseful. Are you more remorseful now? Yes. It's, when you're 17 years old, you, you don't, it really doesn't sink in exactly what you've done. Because up until then, I've been, on a, I've been moving at a thousand miles an hour. There was no slowing down, there was, there was no opportunity to think. I, he did not give me an opportunity to think because when I think, I have doubts. So he always kept me preoccupied with, on a need to know basis, who could slow me in a single path. And um, I never really had the opportunity to absorb what was happening and its overall impact, not only on myself, but on others. So that is what happened. So you're saying, while you were 17 years old, and he essentially controlled your mind, you had no control, you had no thought about what you were doing. You just acted. You just killed. It, 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 was, it was a process that started in Antigua. When I met him, he was at the farm. And he got arrested while I was in Antigua, and I quit too, and I took care of the children for months. I mean, I took over the business, I took care of the children, I did what? What kind of business? So, computers? Uh, yes, yeah. computers selling American birth certificates and chicken passports, the whole one. That's what he was doing. And he had a safe house, and that's where I kept the children. I homeschooled them and did everything with help from one or two other people. The relationship, see, this is what happened. I need the father. And I wanted my father to chase after me the way he chased after his children. So in my mind, he was already a hero. Because you don't see that a lot in the Caribbean. A father with two children who would abandon his life just to have his children, leave his business, leave his money, just to have his children. That's what I wanted from my father. So immediately, immediately, everything was just, for me, was, was fully available. And I... I told him pretty much everything about myself. So he had the keys to my entire mind and how I was. I had a lot of rage and self-hate. So it wasn't easy to completely deface and destroy what was a very weak character because I had no roots. I mean, between the age of seven and 15, I'd already lived in 21 different places. I stayed in cells longer than I'd ever lived at any one place at any point in time in my life when I was on the street. So I didn't have any roof. So I'm he provided that around. roof over your head. But at the end of the day, you were still 17. Most 17-year-olds know right from wrong. What was different here? What was it that co compelled what, you or what, made you think what, it was okay to shoot all those people? What made it? It's not so much okay. What made it possible was the philosophy. He had me under a, a philosophy that was a mixture of nation of Islam with his own twist. So instead of looking at people as people, I looked at people, for example, American per se, as the enemy and as a part of the system. 
system which he did not agree with and wanted to destroy. When I came to high school, I had a lot of questions about slavery, history. Why are we still in this position? When I asked my teachers, a lot of them felt, because I asked very poor questions. And I did so in a respectful manner, but I wanted answers. As to how, at 400, 500 years later, we're still in a position of basically, to a certain extent, being beggared and really trying to struggle out of independence to become who we really are. And they couldn't give me answers. You know, they didn't tell me that's not what we want to discuss in this class. And if we're studying world history, that's a relevant question. I would go to him and answer these questions, and he gave me a bunch of half truths and answers. Because I already had enough rage and self rage and self hate. It was easy to twist everything. He didn't get me like, look, when I met him for the first nine months, let's go kill people. It was not like that. The first time I went to kill someone, it was not like that. Was, I went through a, a process of a month visualizing myself at the range and shooting myself in the face because Lee Boy Malvo had to die and become Lee Muhammad. The Lee. So it, it, was, it was a systematic process of destroying what I was. All this is all your moral compunction. Everything you believe has to die in order to become what I need you to be so we can put this family back together. But Lee, from what I understand, you were also from a very young age abusing animals, correct? And torturing them. So when no, you... It, that was something that was blown completely out of proportion. Okay. In, in, in Jamaica, uh, we just really don't have a lot of cats. Cats and dogs really don't sleep in the house where I grew up, like talking about. They just, they just don't. Oh, my God, cats. I was throwing stone at him. Did I kill cats, hang cats, burn cats? No. That's not what happened. That was a statement that was completely blown out of proportion. Okay, so Jamaica, let me ask, that. let me ask you this, Jamaica, how did it, in your mind, inform your criminal ways? Did it have anything to do with your criminal ways? What age were you when you picked up a gun? I was 16 years old when I first picked up a gun. So after meeting John Muhammad? Yeah. Okay. Now, see, a lot of things have happened leading up to that. I lived in Weymouth Farm and Tivoli in, the, in between three and seven years old. I had seen, I mean, I've had a police officer's brains on my shoulder when they were doing, doing raids. I had seen violence. There was no therapy, there was nothing. So those are things that were never dealt with, never discussed. I mean, I seen a lot of sick things in Jamaica and lived through on a daily basis. So there were a lot of things. It was not, there was the switch. And before that, I'd never been expelled, never been suspended, never been arrested, never did anything violent. If I had found a mentor who was willing to help me to deal with what I was going through and lead me in the correct direction, I was in high school. I was about to graduate at 15. Everything was, he took that rage and anger and self-hate. A person that hates himself, hurting people hurt people. It, it's very easy for someone who's in ways to hate himself not to value life. How many and people did you hurt, people. Lee? Because during the D.C. sniper shootings, 10 people were killed, three others injured, but you said you've committed multiple other crimes. Can you Correct. recall how many people you've killed in total that you've pulled the trigger and killed? Hello? I would I would say over probably somewhere between twenty to two deaths. Twenty two deaths? I, somewhere between twenty to two deaths. Twenty to twenty four. You've personally killed twenty to twenty four people. Well see this for example, I went through a process of training for months which involved robbing, killing, and assassinating people. Whether it's murder for hire, killing people, robbery, with guns, with knives, with just your bare hands. And I would evaluate it after each quote-unquote mission. It wasn't 
what is the process of, I just got up one day, it was a systematic process as if you were training something. That's how it was, that's how it was done. So during that process of building up to what eventually happened, from what I understand, you reached out to some of these other victims that you either wounded or killed. You reached out to their families. The last interview said that with Matt Lauer. What was their response when you reached out to them? Well, in all honesty, the ones I reached out to actually made an effort to reach out to me first. And that gave me the opportunity to actually speak to and the response for most of those that reached out to me first, there was pain, there was anger, but one, I think they were able to understand what I was saying, because for the most part, they were moms who had children that were my age. And once they heard what I had to say in that, I went and picked up off the street one day and was told to kill people. This was a process nearly two years in the making. It wasn't the same thing happened to child soldiers every single day. This is nothing strange that doesn't happen on a regular basis in the world we live in. It just happens to happen here at this point in time. It happens every single day. The email goes in every single day. In I find that hard to fathom that there's a Lee Boyd Malvo being created every day, that somebody could be so damaged that they would think it would be okay to go out and wreak such havoc on different people, so many different people. You said somewhere between 20 to 24. I don't, I don't know if you understand complete control. I don't know if you understand when someone has complete control. The best analogy I can give you is when a woman stays in an abusive relationship for years, up until the point that she gets murdered and dies, and gets to a point that people can be that damage in which they're willing to accept that. It happens. And that, that individual, that abuser, has total domination and control. The moment it gets to that point, the other party just pretty much looks to reach. There is a body, but it's really not a person. That's what happens. For me to explain to you what it is for someone to control your diet, when you sleep, what you sleep, what you eat, what you live to, to go through hypnosis, to go through meditation, to go through centering techniques. It was a complete 24 hours. There was no stop. There was no break. There was no time to think. Once he earned my trust, he pretty much had everything. He had everything, Lee. That's what you say. Now, Going for. Go ahead. The question that has bothered me the most is what did we make me capable of doing that? And it's pretty much what it boils down to is this. You really don't care about dying. You repress and you're very angry and rage in your drug of choice. If you hurt yourself, it is not at all hard to hurt others. Lee, are you looking to bring the story of this abuse and this control to light now because you're hoping perhaps for some sort of sympathy from the general public? I noticed this week your lawyers asked the federal courts to vacate this 10 life sentences that you got on the basis that you weren't quite 18 at the time of your crimes, right? And so you shouldn't have been given a life sentence to begin with. In your mind, are the two aligned? That was a compound question, and I missed several parts. Would you repeat the question, please? I was asking the issue of child abuse and control. Why bring it up? 
Are you trying to get any sympathy from the general public let me, let me, uh, about your really, circumstances? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to a nervous breakdown or most of the nervous breakdown to understand experience is the only way to know. You know by doing so it. So what I'm trying to say is someone has to have to went through that to understand what I'm saying. The very first question my father asked me when he saw me was if I'm a black one. That's the very first question. He didn't ask me, are you okay? Are you hungry? Do you have money in your book? He asked me, you know, in so many words, are you a savage? We're from a, home, a homophobic culture that has no tolerance or acceptance. Now, do I identify myself as homosexual? No. But with what happened, that's the very first question this man asked. When was this? Do you, do you, do you understand when you, you had ran away from someone on multiple occasions, and he tells you he don't want nothing to do with you, and the very first time you see him, the very first question you have to ask you, are you a boxing boy? What that feel like, and what it's like to process that? I had to handle one thing at a time. I couldn't overload myself by trying to deal with the entire gamut of what I had done. I took things piece by piece. I'm in solitary confinement, with no human contact, I can't even see outside. In here, I am psychologist, I am priest, I am teacher, I am my own best friend, and my own worst enemy. There is no help here. So I dealt with it in a manner that wouldn't allow me to crash and burn. I was woken up and hadn't slept for days and just bleeding out the nose like I'm a broken clock. I... I see this thing guy who come back from Iraq who looks at me and says, you're going through the same shit I'm going through. You're going through PSPD. But in here, there is no help. If you talk to these people, they're going to record, they can be used against you to keep me where I'm at. Even though we're doing this the entire time, I've done everything that's been asked. I've been charged for nearly 10 years. But it's not going to be to my benefit. They're going to say, look, something is wrong with your mental. So, so you've been in solitary confinement for 10 years? Yes. I've been, I mean, I've, I've got everything. I've been charged free for 10 years. I caught one charge in my first year in the system, and I haven't done anything since. And that wasn't even a charge I did. That was someone having a beef to pick with me because he was in the quote, quote, National Guard and was pulled out in the street and he didn't hurt their life. But Lee, it don't you think that you deserve the harshest punishment that there is given the severity of your crime? How can you, by the way, I saw this Facebook posting. Did you actually write this on Facebook? It says here, the silence in my segregated cell where I'm confined 24 hours a day with no human interaction is deafening. The loneliness unfathomable and my longing for a letter from someone who cares is like the thirst of a man in an arid land, mistreated and regarded like filth. Let me ask you a question. And I've seen this with my own eyes. I have seen someone who came from Rwanda who's done exact same thing that I've done right here. And he was 14 or 15 at the time. He's been through horrid conditions his entire life. Murdered probably dozens of people. At the hands of someone who had complete control over his life at the point of death. And people look at them and understand that he's a child who that was that was if the exact same thing happens here, it is as if it's a monster that was somehow was bred and was born with it. When that is actually not the case. There are people right here in the US who I see on TV, who I've seen in programs, who have done the exact Far more horrible things than I could ever dream of doing. Probably had to hack 25 or more people up top. And these people appear to be here. And they're granted right asylum, allowed to go to school. Now, it doesn't mean I don't deserve to be punished. No, that is not the case. That's not what I'm saying. But that's the disparity. This is the reality as it is here. Your lawyers this week asked for the federal courts to vacate your 10 life sentences on the basis that you weren't quite 18 at the time. I think you just brought that up, the fact that 
this was you as a teen committing this crime. So in your mind, are you saying you don't really believe that you deserve a life sentence? Life, full life as it stands now, 600 years, 12 ago. I believe if I get a chance at age 52 or something, I mean, I can function in society. I honestly know that and I, I can believe that. So you that's, think that you should be allowed to come out somewhere around 50-something? Actually, yes. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this will happen. Instead of keeping a man in prison for life, they should just kill him. Because this is a slow death. You ever been in solitary confinement for two and a half years? <laughs> No, but I also didn't kill so many people, though. In fact, in fact, these conditions are used as forms of torture. <laughs> you know what it is? I've been in Maryland in a pod by myself for two and a half years. There's no human contact except somebody doing around every 15 minutes to make sure you don't kill yourself. You know what that does to a human mind? Keep someone in the hole indefinitely. No chance that you will leave the population to be around prison. It makes no sense. You might as well kill him. Because eventually, you're going to lose your mind. Would you have preferred a sentence of death like your accomplice, John Muhammad? Compared to doing life in prison? Yes. Right now? Yes. This is a slow death. I Total deprivation in every single way you can imagine. Now, I've learned a few things, and I've been able to come to grips to a certain extent with who I am and be able to forgive myself. And for that opportunity, I'm grateful. But then, after one has done that, the question is what else? What next? They're not the regular phases of human life. You're stuck. You know, I want to go to college to do a few things. There are no programs for people like me. There's, I mean, there's nothing. There's a library, there's a pen, there's a paper. I have no family support, no money, so I, I can't go to these things on my own. I want to go to school, I want to go to college. Some semblance of life, something, some goal, something to strive for, to create something. I don't have that. And that is the Lee, what, torture you can do to someone. Lee, what keeps you going every day? Is it religion? I, I, yoga and meditation is what keeps me balanced. Because it keeps me focused on, if I'm washing my clothes, I'm washing my clothes. I don't allow my mind to go anywhere else. I just focus on the task at hand. But I haven't seen touch the blade of grass in 10 years. I can't see outside the cell. No contact with humans or animals. It has taken a toll. I mean, so you don't you, you don't have visitors. It's not. You know, it's every every day I have to get up and create my own sense of purpose. But this, even with that, even with yoga, even with meditation, even with tai chi, even with my faith. The monotony is still torture. But I, I, I value myself, and I have hope that it will get better. So I keep trying. But it, it, it's really a very difficult situation for myself because I have no family support. And I don't have any funds or anything to do. So it's, it's really a very difficult situation to balance out because I really don't have any of the the necessity that most prisoners do have. I'm not in contact with my father, my mother, aunts, nieces, nephews. I mean, they pretty much, except for probably one or two I've heard from time to time, with me off and... So when was the last time that you were in contact with your mom? My mother doesn't speak to me. I haven't heard from her 
she asked me to sign over some property to her, which I did, and that's the last time I heard from her. Um, when she wants something, I hear from her. Other than that, I haven't heard from her in five and a half, six years. Five and a half, six years. And when you heard from her last, was she in Jamaica or elsewhere? The last time I heard from her, she was in Jamaica. I don't know where she is now or what happened. And you said about your father that the first time he saw you, he asked you if you were a batty boy. When was yeah. that? That was in 2000, 2000, 2002. 2002, so, when you first got incarcerated? Actually, actually, 2002, I was in the jail at the time he was brought up for testimony. I mean, him asking me that one question completely precluded me from even coming out and saying that. Because I thought about, you know, I, at that time I had my classmates around me. I had, I have, I, I, to date I haven't responded to any of my classmates. Uh, uh, several of them have reached out to me. And, I mean, I was ashamed. You know, they were asking, you know, during the CHDs I was looking for you on the, on, um, in the papers to see what subjects you asked. And, I see, so I didn't, I didn't know how to deal with that. To think that they would know that about me was, I didn't, I, I was afraid of no uh, They said it's been 30 minutes. I have to, uh, I have to hang up. You have to hang up right now? Yes, right now. Right now. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee. All right. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.